Some time ago, I told a story out of this little book, Little is Much When God is in It, uh, written by Mrs. Cyril Bird about incidents in the life of Sister Abigail, Abigail Townsend Luff, who was a friend of George Mueller's. Her father was a good friend of a brother Mueller, and Abigail eventually moved to New York, to Buffalo, New York, and uh, there she started a, a home for senior believers. And uh, this little book, it's just a small book, maybe five or six chapters, but it's designed as a word of encouragement to God's people. And it begins by quoting the scripture from Proverbs 27, verse 1, just this phrase, you do not know what a day may bring forth. And it begins by telling the story of Sister Abigail going to visit a senior saint, an old lady, who in attempt to make a little money for herself, crocheted some mats. Unfortunately, she had uh, done it with this coarse yellow thread, and uh, Sister Abigail realized it would never, they'd never be able to sell them. And, and so she said, I'll take them home and uh, bleach them so that they'll be more saleable. Uh, it took a very long time. There were so many little sections, and she eventually got some help. And then as she was finishing up, the summon came over and made a lunch for her. She thought she'd skip lunch because she had all these visits to do in the afternoon. And there was sort of this mounting frustration all of this time. Now it was lunch. She still hadn't been out to do these visits. And then she had to politely accept lunch and show gratitude for this lady who had come to make lunch for her. You ever have days like that? where you, you believe you're wanting to do what God wants and all of these interruptions that come to you. And so was the case. Well, eventually she excused herself from the table and she rushed down to catch the streetcar only to see it leaving. And she had to wait another 15 minutes, not fuming exactly, but just feeling that unsettledness because it was taking so long to get to what she believed the Lord wanted her to do that day. When she eventually got on the second car, she was sorting through her gospel tracks. She always carried a supply of tracks with her, and she noticed a short one that simply told a story of uh, someone who asked the question rather rudely, um, do you know where hell is? And after a moment's thought, the Christian answered, yes, it's at the end of a Christless life. And we told this story some time ago where uh, she gave it to the fellow and he was saying, look, I don't really need this. Uh, I'm, I'm as good as they come. Uh, I'm getting off the streetcar. And as soon as I do, I'm going out. We're having a good time tonight and I'm young, and there's no possibility of me dying anytime soon. And she said to him, if you visit a graveyard, you'll find someone just your age. You need to be prepared. Don't go to a Christless grave. And she briefly shared the gospel with him. Well, anyway, um, as the story goes, the next day, someone came, one of the, one of the conductors, came and sought her out and uh, said, you're the one who gave that little tract to the conductor about uh, going to a Christless grave. She said, yes, I did. Did you know that he died? What? He had stepped off, slipped, and fallen under the wheels of another car. And she was just so grief-stricken by this. But the next day, she was on another rail line, and uh, another conductor came to her, sought her out, and said, you're the woman that gave that tract to that young conductor. And she said, please, please, I already heard about it. I don't think I can bear to hear it again. And he said, well, he didn't die right away. I went with him to the hospital, and he asked me to seek you out and to tell you he did not go to a Christless grave, that he had put his trust in Christ as you told him to. 
Well, she felt led then to write a little gospel tract telling the story, and it was called I'm Not Going to a Christless Grave, Are You? And she told the story of this young man. So then Mrs. Cyril Bird asked the question, is it possible for a person to get saved and not to have any fruit from their life? And the answer was no. If you're abiding in Christ, if you're connected to him, there will be fruit. And she pictured the thief on the cross. What could he do? He put his trust in Christ. He was nailed to a tree. Uh, he couldn't uh, go and do any good works. What could he do? Apart from a little word of encouragement to his friend to repent and turn to Christ, and his no doubt encouragement of the Lord Jesus in that moment when everyone forsook him and fled, he was reaching out to Christ. But she said, think of all the preachers, all the Christians who have shared the story of the thief on the cross to plead with people in their dying hour to also trust Christ. And what a harvest that young man will someday see as a result of his death. So then she asked the question, what about this conductor? Is there any fruit from his life? And so the little book goes, story after story after story, and in the heart of it is this particular story. Her friend, Iona, had been sick for quite a while and finally was uh, able, strong enough, to go on a little journey with Sister Abigail, and they were sitting on the streetcar, and directly across from them was a Roman Catholic priest in his garb. And uh, Iona said to Sister Abigail, I feel very strongly that this, this man should receive that tract that you wrote about the conductor, but I, I don't feel I have the strength to do it. And so uh, Sister Abigail gets up and she goes over to the priest and she offers him the tract. And when she does, he, he not only refuses it, but berates her for going around and trying to proselytize people. And he says to her that um, you're one of those people who think uh, that you're going to be in heaven someday. And she responds, oh, no, sir, indeed I am not. I would not dare to presume to think any such thing. Well, he sort of softens then a bit, and uh, as the car begins to slow down for the stop, he finally does receive the tract. And she says, this story is perfectly true. It happened to a conductor on the B Street car. I know the facts, and I wrote the tract. And so, rather reluctantly, he accepted the paper, put it in his pocket, and then she clarified what she meant when he said, you think that you're going to be in heaven someday. And so she says, if you will pardon me, sir, and permit further intrusion to prevent misunderstanding, I feel I must explain about my not presuming to think. I don't think anything at all about it, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day, 2 Timothy 1.12. I know, I know whom I have believed. And so they get off the cars, and that's, that seems to be the end of the story. Two years passed, and then she was invited to visit a lady who was in a, a Catholic hospital in Buffalo. And again, took her little tracks with her, and she was sneaking them in under mats and, and behind photos or pictures on the wall and in little crevices. And um, the mother superior saw her and, and put her hand on her shoulder and said, listen, I, I'm not against you. I, I, I appreciate you. You have to be careful, though. You know, someone may may banish you from this building. You may not be able to come back and visit. And so there was this this little warning, right? But then, as as some time went by, um, the woman came back to her again and said, "I noticed this little paper that you placed under the mat. 
are you the woman that uh, wrote this little paper? And she said, yes, I am. Well, she said, my brother wants to see you. My brother is dying. He's at a friend's home in a town nearby, and he told me about you, and he told me about this paper. And he very much wants to meet you. And so on a certain day, she called this woman Sister Cautious, uh, and that's really where the term Sister Abigail came from. This woman called her Sister Abigail. And the two of them made the journey by train and came to uh, the home of this friend where the priest was lying. He was in the last stages of what they used to call consumption. As he came, um, he extended his two hands and he said, Oh, you, you are the one that told me I know whom I have believed. And you said you could not presume to think such a thing. Now I too know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Oh, I know, I know whom I have believed. Well, Sister Cautious, the actual sister of the priest, she said, uh, you're not going to leave the true church, are you? And to this, Sister Abigail turned to uh, Peter's epistle, uh, chapter 2, the fifth verse, and read, You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And she said, look, the true church is made up of living stones, of living members, and once we put our trust in Christ, we become true priests of God, all of us. Well, she was asked to pray, and so she prayed for the man, and he responded, let her prayers be answered for Jesus Christ's sake. Now, as the time drew near for him to die, the priests arrived with their crucifix, with their, their crosses, and, and they wanted him to kiss it. And he said, oh, no, no, it's not a piece of wood that I'm going to kiss. It's the Lord Jesus himself. My salvation is in him. And uh, they were going to put Sister Abigail out of the room. And he said, no, she's the one who taught me how I can know for sure. And I know whom I have believed. And so these were his dying words as he was passing away. He says, um, my path is light now. The eyes are growing dim, but oh, it's getting light. For I can see him whom I have learned to know. And I know he is able. He is able. A long pause. He is able to keep unto that day. And so he died. But that's not the end of the story. The story goes on to describe how in, in his dying breath, he had prayed for his sister and his brother that they also be saved. And the story goes on to describe how Sister Abigail was called by this mother superior to come and meet with her. They went to a park and talked, and still the woman held back, like, how could I ever give up the church? And then how this dear woman was gloriously saved. And then how she went to England to see her brother. And then one day, how this man showed up at the door of Sister Abigail and said, I have something for you. And there was a little package. And in the package was the Bible that Sister Abigail had given to the sister, this uh, Sister Cautious. And also a copy of Francis Ridley Havergal's poems. And she had given them to this woman. And here was the brother who had been saved while his sister was dying. On her deathbed, she had manifested this joy and certainty about her salvation, and he too had put his trust in Christ. And this is just one little strain of stories. There are all sorts of these stories. In fact, there's another whole book, which I haven't been able to find, a book which is called, if anybody has a copy, I'd love to see it. It's simply called That Little Book by Mrs. Cyril Bird. And so she continues these stories, but all leading back 
to that day. You never know what a day will bring forth. The fact that she was interrupted in her plans, she was waylaid by, by doing this thing for this old woman to sell these mats. Uh, she, she was held up by lunch. She missed the, the car that she was hoping to catch. But through all of that, she rendezvoused with this young man who didn't know it, but was within hours of his death and how the gospel reached that young man. And then as she points out, Mrs. Bird, Bird points out, that young man's life was not without fruit because through his testimony written on the little track, this whole family got saved and many others. She goes on to describe others in Toronto and other places who put their trust in Christ as a result of the testimony. Judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes. He's going to show us what he's been able to do with little corns of wheat that fell into the ground and died. And those who receive Christ, even in their dying moments, the story is not over. Like Samson, they may accomplish more in their death than they do in their life. What a wonderful God. And so this priest learned how to be a true priest, how to discover true salvation, and how to be able to say, I know. I know, and not to think so, but to know so, because of the promise that is given to us in the Word of God.